and gentlemen. Thank you for taking the time out of this beautiful summer night to come to our program, which is sponsored by the Albany County League of Women Voters and the Women's Press Club of New York State. My name is Lisa Robert Lewis. I'm president of the Press Club, and I'm also one of the senior editors of the Times Union. It was back a few months ago that Margaret Dane of the League of Women Voters approached us about doing a program, and we thought, what an amazing idea on such a topical issue that's affecting all of us. We've seen it in our, with our families, our friends, our work. Uh, it's, we're, in, we're navigating a very interesting time in our country. Anyway, I did first off wanted to make a few announcements. First, if everybody could make sure their cell phones are turned off. Second, if, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but in the back, there are index cards and members of the press club and legal room voters will be um, wandering around throughout the presentation. Uh, feel free to write down your questions and we'll get through as many as possible, time permitting. We encourage you to put them down so that we can, uh, you know, have our very talented panel tackle this issue. Uh, I would like to thank the people from the League of Women Voters who worked on this program, and that was Margaret Danes and Amy Alou. And I also would like to thank Joanne Krupe and Deb Rausch, who were instrumental, the four of them, in putting this program together. At this point in time, I'd like to ask members of the League and members of the board of uh, the Women's Press Club to stand for some recognition on the fine efforts they do in these programs. There is a quote in the program tonight by uh, Joanne Jenkins, the CEO of AARP, and I would ask you to take a look at it. And in part, I think it gets to the heart of the matter why we're holding this program tonight. Restoring civility to public discourse begins with each of us individually. How we talk to and relate to one another, taking the extra step to understand why a person believes differently than we do, and being able to disagree with one another while still respecting the other person. And I think that says it all about what we're trying to accomplish tonight. I guess I would ask you all to think when you go to put down your questions, you know, how the current lack of civility is affecting all of our lives. I know it became an issue for me and my own family back, back almost two years ago now. We didn't have the knockdown drag out fights that a lot of families did, but we really started questioning why different members of our family felt this way. I know it bothered me why one of my siblings voted a certain way. And we've had a lot of discussions and discussions. I've seen it in my work, and Casey can address this more, in terms of, you know, when we try to present the truth, what has happened as a result. Uh, it's just been a very interesting time. And I have concerns for us and our nation, but I also have concerns for the future. I saw, for instance, in my own family, when my brother and I get really going, I see my niece, a 23-year-old, educated person has bachelor's degree working on her master's degree, she runs. She wants nothing to do with politics. She wants nothing to do with voting. And we're like, what are we doing to the next generation? For every Parkland student who I applaud for getting involved in the process, I worry about those like my niece who are just distraught at what's happening. So I hope you enjoy the program tonight. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our main speaker of the evening, my co-worker, Casey Seiler, who is senior editor of news at the Times Union, and is also co-host of WMHT's New York Now. Casey? Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters and the Women's Press Club for um, having the foresight to schedule this discussion of civility on the same day that the uh, woman behind the hottest show on TV uh, went down as the result of an uncivil comment. Lisa took me aside a couple of months ago and said, I think Roseanne Barr is going to be good until about end of May, so let's schedule the event for them. <laughs> well, it's amazing. I, she is the best sourced person in the newsroom, I swear. So I will get to the topic of this evening's discussion in a moment, but first, here's a story about poodles. Uh, the year was 2008, which, as many of you can recall, was the last time that it seemed like the republic was falling apart. In the middle of the presidential election between John McCain and Barack Obama, uh, an August silly season topic cropped up, and it concerned what kind of dog the Obamas should get for their daughters, and, of course, conceivably could bring to the White House if, um, if Barack Obama managed to prevail that November. 
The American Kennel Club actually got into the act and released the results of a poll that sought suggestions for what kind of breed the family should get. I uh, believe one of the Obama daughters, I'm not sure which one, was allergic to pet hair, so they had to get a hypoallergenic dog. So the short list uh, offered up by the Kennel Club uh, included a number of dogs that I had just never heard of, like the soft-coated Wheaton Terrier and the Chinese Crested. But the winner, uh, according to the AKC's poll, was a poodle. Now, I posted the news on uh, the Times Union's Capital Confidential blog, which then is now, was our most popular blog, and then offered what I thought was a very reasonable point that, as I wrote it, there is no way on God's green earth that Obama is going to get a poodle, a breed with a distinctly French connotation in the popular psyche. I can see the Republican response now, quote, John McCain owns an English Springer Spaniel and a, and a mutt as diverse as this great land of ours, but when, a, when Barack Obama decided to buy a pet, he chose a poodle, the same dog chosen by Weird Al Yankovic and Prince Rupert of the Rhine. <laughs> and if there are any poodle owners in the audience tonight, please don't get up and walk out because the rest of the program is really gonna be special. <laughs> I was at this point um, very new to the duties of State House Editor. I'd only been doing it for a couple of months. Um, and one of the duties, by far my least favorite duty, uh, overseeing that blog, in addition to all of our regular coverage, was having the responsibility of uh, either accepting or deleting or just simply rejecting uh, blog comments. Um, uh, anonymous online blog comments, as you can imagine. In this instance, uh, the responses included a comment that Obama was, quote, a terrorist appeaser and waffler and should have a French poodle. John McCain, who is decisive, should have a British bulldog, like Churchill had, <laughs> close quote. And that, of course, set me to thinking. Uh, Winston Churchill, of course, looked like a bulldog, but I thought it was a little bit, I'm not insulting him to say that, he was proud of it, but I thought it was a little bit too on the nose that he would have actually had a bulldog. Um, and of course, with maybe two minutes of web research, I found out that, in fact, that revered British Prime Minister had never had a bulldog, but spent his entire adult life devoted to a single breed of dog. Can you guess what it was? <laughs> Very good! You know this story already! Yes, the poodle. Stupidly thinking that I had stumbled upon what many readers would hopefully find to be a fascinating irony, I posted to a poodle file website called, I swear to God, Companions to Genius. <laughs> I'm sure it's still out there. Okay, and this was one reader's repost. Quote, this is getting good. The left-wing liberal, all caps, Times Union writers are not satisfied simply mocking the GOP in their paper. They are now blogging and writing corrective missives at anyone who publicly illustrates the blatant and flagrant left-wing bias of the paper and their writing staff. <laughs> and of course, they misspelled publicly. <laughs> I gotta say that at this point, I was not sure which candidate I was helping. Um, but I posted a link to a 1953 Associated Press photo showing Churchill in the back seat of a car sitting next to a poodle and reiterated that, and here's another quote, the man loved poodles as much as he hated Hitler. <laughs> sure, of course, the image could have been faked. Perhaps Churchill had actually been sitting next to Lee Harvey Oswald or Amelia Earhart, but I had to try. Um, this debate raged on the blog for six more hours and encompassed 27 more comments. At some point in the afternoon, a reader actually got offline and emailed me and said, I think maybe you're taking this little cul-de-sac argument a little bit too seriously, you know, don't you have other things to do? Now, looking back at this episode from the vantage point of almost a decade, I recognize now that it represents, in microcosm, Two of the trends that, to my mind, are the primary causes of the breakdown in civility in our public discourse. The toxic blend of online anonymity and the inability of a large percentage of the population to acknowledge shared reality, otherwise known as facts. The Obamas ended up getting a Portuguese water dog, which they named Bo. 
that those are two facts. <laughs> in my ensuing eight years of covering politics, but really kicking into overdrive um, uh, since the 2016 election, uh, these problems have exacerbated. As the Times Union's news editor, I've discovered that while the problem is rooted in politics, the lack of civility extends to almost every subject that our reporters might take up. I have, however, delivered a strategy for dealing with some of the most irate callers that mo might point a way forward. Whenever I discover that a particularly antagonistic message has been left on my voicemail, I avail myself of the fact that our system captures the caller's phone number, unless, of course, they are blocked, and I'll call them back. Deploying what I have deemed to be an acceptably pale lie, what my mother would call an acceptable fib, um, I tell them in my most honeyed tones that while our system recorded a call from this number, the message was, alas, not preserved. Uh, and, and what did they want to discuss? <laughs> Almost invariably, the worst voicemail ranter will be disarmed by an actual responding human voice. Not all the time, but at least enough to give us reason for hope. So, in closing, I will correct myself. I said that this problem has exacerbated, though the proper term is really metastasized, because that is the way we should view it as a cancer on the body politic, one which, if left unchecked, could imperil our democracy. And now, uh, to introduce our outstanding panelists tonight, and I will be um, joining them, but I will be shutting up because I just had a, a good chunk of my say, or I will, I will be contributing, <coughs> not a lot. Uh, Susan Arbetter, host and producer of the syndicated public radio program, Capital Press Room, distributed by Syracuse-based WCNY, where she serves as Director of News and Public Affairs. She's the recipient of, of over 30 awards for electronic journalism, including an Emmy Award for Best Public Affairs Series for the television show Insight, an Edward R. Murrow Award, a Scripps Howard Award for Environmental Journalism. She and I are both longtime cast members in the musical comedy review, The LCA Show, where her advice to cast members has always been, above all else, civility. <laughs> Next up, we have Laura Whalen, Dean of the School of Liberal Arts at Siena College. Whalen is uh, founder and chair of Siena's Civil Discourse Working Group, comprised of students, faculties, and administrators. Her teaching background is in rhetoric with analysis of arguments and construction of logical premises. And next we have Scott Fine, chair of the Government Law Center at Albany Law School and a senior partner at the law firm of Whiteman, Osterman, and Anna. Scott teaches civility and ethics to lawyers for the New York State Bar Association, which is the reason why New York's lawyers are famous for their civility. <laughs> he served as assistant counsel to former governors Hugh Carey and Mario Cuomo. And last but certainly not least, Linda McKenney, a senior wellness coach and motivational speaker. Linda uh, formerly worked as a group counselor for Focused Healthcare and Four Winds Psychiatric Hospital. She is a former Vice President of Education and Training at SEPI. Please welcome our panelists. So, everybody sent me some talking points, which I really appreciate. But I thought we could start uh, just by opening with a simple question. And that is, how did we get to this point? How did we go from, you know, the Lincoln-Douglas debates to little fat rocket man or whatever? He said, and, and, and Rush Limbaugh, you're a big fat idiot. Um, so is it simply the anonymity of social media? Is it uh, that we just have so much contempt for each other? Why don't we start with Lara? What do you think? How did we get here? Well, I think social media certainly plays a role. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, but I actually think it goes back a little bit earlier than that to argument as entertainment. And so if you think back to the early 2000s and the program on CNN, Crossfire, does anybody remember that? Sure. Which I used to love and think was the greatest entertainment. And then in 2004, John Stewart went on Crossfire. And I don't know how many of you saw this, this particular episode, but he went on basically to beg them to stop and said, you're hurting America. And it was really at that moment that I thought, yeah, you're right. This sort of empty soundbite 
shallow, he said, she said argument as entertainment um, is really problematic and that's actually when I changed the way that I taught argument and moved towards uh, teaching argument as mediation instead of picking a side and arguing for that. But uh, yeah, social media definitely played a role, but uh, when you add in um, you know, of any stripe, if you look at 24-hour news cycles where they just have to fill time so we get people on who are not necessarily experts, right? So they're just on, uh, I love when there's breaking news and people come on and just speculate about what they think is happening. All of those things, news as entertainment and argument as entertainment has really changed the nature of this course. Um, we're gonna come back to that in a moment. Scott Fine, what about you? How did we get here? <coughs> Uh, we, we got here together. We, we got, I'm, I'm assuming that 51% that of you are progressives. I guess this is an assumption and the others will take issue. But, but um, it, it was fairly nuanced. It didn't occur yesterday or a year before. It started with the, the um, creation of our country. And, and I ask you to just hang on for a second. It won't get all that complex, I promise. But, but when, 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 when they wrote the First Amendment, the lawyers, and I'll attribute this to lawyers, had a choice. They could have something which said, the government may not involve themselves in speech, or they could say that people have a right to speech. All other progressive democratic nations chose the former. They said the government can't get involved, semicolon, except for certain circumstances. We were the outlier. We said, oh no, People have a right to speak, and you cannot, you cannot somehow undermine that. So that, that was fact one. Uh, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, then we had New York Times versus Sullivan. I'm just going to go ahead to the quickly quick, quick, in 1984. Now, directly after the Civil War, let me go to the Civil War. Civil War, we had the Northern press was constantly writing about the Civil War, and then going forward, the civil rights period. All they do is write about the civil rights period, and people would get angrier and angrier. And so the southern governors in the 1960s decided that they would bring 300 defamation actions, 300 defamation actions against the New York Times and other northeastern newspapers. Stop defaming the South and talking about civil rights. It went to the United States Supreme Court at the request of the progressives, me, and the Supreme Court of the United States said quite simply, oh no, you cannot sue a newspaper for defamation. You may not sue a newspaper for defamation unless you can demonstrate the newspaper knew it was lying or acting with malice. Which meant from that point forward, newspapers, the media, could say anything they wanted with abandon. We did that in order to advance the civil rights. And what was that case called? Uh, New York Times versus Sullivan. Um, and it was, um, let's see, 1964. It was enacted in 1964. So as you listen to me now, I'm going to be quiet in a second. Just put this in the category of unintended consequences. Founders of our country decided the First Amendment should be, should be impenetrable. The right to speak should be impenetrable. Then the right to print should be impenetrable. And then finally, we had the Fairness Doctrine, in 19, uh, which was enacted in 1949. And the Fairness Doctrine said, quite simply, that you can't, there are only so many licenses for broadcasting. So one, everyone has to talk about controversial issues, and two, give some time to the opposite perspective. It was a great idea. And um, during the Reagan administration, uh, it was recent. And do you know what the progressives did? Not much. We sat by and we said, well, you have cable, TV, you have all. So as a consequence, we've been li living in a sort of closed loop media environment. But that concludes my introductory remark. Thank you very much, Sidori. Um, so we, we have gone from argument as entertainment to our rights of speech. And we go now to Linda. What do you think contributed to how we got to where we are now? I do think that being anonymous in social media um, does promote 
um, the possibility of saying things that we would never say face to face. And we see that with bullying, um, particularly. But I also think that people feel very passionate about their beliefs and they don't really know how to express that. So they speak from a place of influence and I don't mean like they're under the influence of alcohol, they're under the influence of fear or frustration. And when people are, are in that place, then they're not able to speak logically. And we don't know necessarily how to calm that person down in order to have a logical conversation. So it just sort of goes haywire. And I think it starts at the very base level of families and communities and friends. And then, you know, filters out into the government. So I, I like to think that we can start in those places and change things and not wait to see if things are going to change at the highest levels. So frustration and anger? Frustration, anger, fear. Those things um, are very emotional feelings and if we're in that kind of emotional state, actually we can't even think logically, so we can't have a logical conversation. Casey. How did we get here? Um, well, I, I, think we, I think we've been here before. Um, I, I think that we were probably here in, in the late 60s, based, you know, based on study. I was, I was barely alive for that, but you know, based on my reading and my study of the, of, of the period, I think that this nation was fairly rent apart. I mean, um, I would highly recommend the histories of um, Rick Perlstein, who um, is working on what he plans will be a, a four-part cycle on sort of the rise of modern conservatism from Goldwater to Reagan. And um, I think the, the first book is called Before the Storm, the second one is called Nixon Land, and the one that he published most recently is called The Invisible Bridge, which came out of that. Has anybody read that book? It's awesome. Um, it, it basically looks at the years uh, kind of 1973 to 1976. And if you read it, it's an amazing portrait of a society that is going through a lot of the same sort of eruptions that we are going through right now. Um, uh, conspiracy theories were wild. Um, tales of Baroque violence were abroad in the land, you know, uh, representing all the social forces that the, that the majority was, uh, was terrified of. The president was under siege. People didn't trust the news. Of course, the news back then was um, represented, was a lot more institutional and there were a lot fewer outlets. And I think if there is a new twist to our problem today, it is on this device, um, uh, someone with absolutely no credibility has as much psychic weight for uh, too large a percentage of our population as the New York Times or the Washington Post or you know the, the Times Union for that matter. And I think I think that is the that is the, the the new twist on the old problem of the nation tearing itself apart along ideological lines. So we have conspiracy theories, fear, free speech, uh, and argument is entertainment. And if we roll all of this up into a wicked little ball um, and, and add living in an echo chamber into that mix, you're going to have people talking to each other and not listening to anybody else. Um, how do you start to listen when you have no respect and feel contempt for the person you're speaking to, Lara? Um, that's an excellent question. Uh, I think <laughs> um, I pick up on something that, that Linda said that um, in some ways it starts with the family, and I don't know how many of you have this experience, but I know for myself, I am on one side of the political spectrum and the entire rest of my family is on the other side, and yet we have to exist together as a family, and I think the you know, sort of pressure of that, 
we can either not talk about things, which works for a day, or you know, um, or we can figure out how to remember that when you're in the echo chamber and the other side is being demonized constantly, you know, whatever that demonization is, they're stupid, they're idiotic, they're brainless, they're whatever. When you're faced with a real person and it gets back to that issue of real audiences and real people and, and actually sort of being face to face and you realize, oh, you know, that person is my dad or my sister or my daughter or whatever, um, to remember their humanity I think is a, is a first step in thinking about really listening to what they have to say as frustrating as it can be sometimes. Okay, we're not always just talking to you know your brother or your father-in-law. We're talking to people on the other side of the political aisle. Casey is talking to people who have contributed to the comment section of Capital Confidential. Scott, you're talking to people on the other side of the courtroom, which is uh, in itself an adversarial relationship right from the get-go. So how do you make that civil? Well, I. I think that there, we try to keep, we, we the bar here, try to keep two premises, and I'm overstating it, I think. But, um, the first is that we are an imperfect species, and those of you who are not going to be now, but we are generally imperfect. And so the notion of facts, facts, immutable facts, is presumptuous. We cannot have facts. We have perceptions, we bring our life experiences. There is no such. So once you decide, once you come to the conclusion that everything your client told you is based upon their somewhat twisted sometimes <laughs> perception of reality, there can be no fact. And so it, what it does is it takes the energy out of your, the, the angst, the, 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 you would call it toxicity, out of your presentation. And then because it's important to hear someone else's perception of their fact, which does not necessarily exist. You get outside your loop. And so what you try to do is you go to the, your adversary, the other lawyer, and you'll say, let's have dinner. Let's have dinner. How are the kids? How are you? How are you married? Good. That's great. Wonderful. What do you think about the case? And lawyers often harbor the same skepticism about their client's position that you have about yours. And soon, in sharing these perspectives on non-facts and acknowledging that there is no such thing, you, you get to a common core of consensus perspectives. And sometimes that allows resolution in the absence of um, two gladiators going at it. All right, so that works in the courtroom, where it's very sort of formal. It's a formal situation. If you're just having a conversation with your neighbor or online, uh, Linda, and it's about something on which people have very polarized feelings, let's say abortion, how do you, how do you find that commonality that Scott is talking about? First of all, if you're conversing online, never use all caps. <laughs> because what that does, is it already sets the, the tone. And setting the tone is really important. Um, it, your intention is important. And, and what I like to tell people are two things. One is that if you're not ready to have this kind of conversation, if somebody is starting it and you're not ready to participate in it, to give yourself permission to say, I can't do this right now. I would like to have this conversation. I would like to better understand your position, but I'm not in the best place to do that right now. And give yourself permission to, to do it another time. Um, because if you're vulnerable in that moment, it's very difficult to have a civil conversation. The other thing is, is once we decide that other people are the others, they're not like us, they're, we cast them in a role completely different from us, 
then it's really hard to have a civil conversation. Civility is not about agreeing with a person necessarily, it's simply about respecting that person. And we have a lot more in common than we do differences. So we might go about those um, in different ways or try to achieve what we want in different ways. But if we kind of look at the basis of humanity, um, we're more alike than we are different. And so what I find, if I am able to have a civil conversation, and I'm not always able to do that, I have to walk away sometimes, but if I'm able to, I'm successful if I have the intent, I let that person know that my intention is simply to listen and it can just, and I'm not trying to change your mind, I'm not trying to sway you over to my side, that can somehow diffuse that person a little bit. And also um, that my intention is, I know I'm fully invested in the intention of simply listening. And that is all I'm going to do in this moment is listen, I'm not going to offer my opinion that that can open up a conversation between neighbors and family members. Doesn't civil discourse depend on sort of an agreement from both sides that they are going to be uh, willing to listen, willing to make concessions, willing to see shades of gray, and not being ideologically rigid in whatever stance they hold? Yes. It, but not everybody's always ready to do that in that moment. So sometimes it means that, you, you know, you sort of take the conversation, um, you take sort of a, a step backward and you make that connection, you build a bridge of commonality, like having dinner over whatever it might be, or having a cup of coffee, or starting out with a neutral conversation and finding that bridge, finding the connection then um, when both people are calm, you're able to sort of set the guidelines for the conversation. Yes, can we both agree to refrain from certain words? Or can we both agree to not scream at one another? And, but that has to come from a place of um, logic. And if you're already upset, that's really hard to do. I'm gonna uh, start with some of these questions. Um, what are three things, Casey, that each of us in the room tonight should do to encourage more civil discourse? I, I mean, of course I'm going to say support your local media. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I am. Well, what I was going to say, thank you, Bianca. Um, no, what, um, when, it comes, when it comes to doing that in the political realm, I, I would say that it, it does go to, you know, picking a set of facts that you, um, that you recognize. In other words, um, recognize uh, honest or at least quasi-honest brokers in information that these discussions and these debates can, um, can be built around. And that means um, if you see, <laughs> If you see something that you have reason to doubt, but yet you feel the need to retail it simply because it confirms your own political passion or political bias, look into it a little bit more. Um, in other words, just be, be a good consumer of facts. Be a good consumer and a good online distributor. Not even online, but in, in, in all social interactions, aim to be a good, consumer and dissemin disseminator of information. That's one. I think that um, I think that being a good listener is, uh, you know, as we've already discussed, is is absolutely is absolutely key. That um, I was I was thinking um, as Linda was talking that um, being able to uh, to develop that skill, that kind of and it really is, it's, a, it's, it's politeness, but it's also a craft of kind of holding, holding yourself, uh, kind of uh, stepping aside from your passions for a moment when you're trying to engage with another person. That's something that, that journalists are supposed to do, you know, unless you're, uh, you know, I'm, I, I have a column once a week, but the rest of the time I'm, a, I'm an editor, you know, and um, that's what journalists are supposed to do all the time. They're supposed to be able to set aside their passions 
on a specific topic in the interest of the craft of telling the story well and telling the story with accuracy and balance and accountability. So, um, which is not to say that all journalists are parag paragons of civility all the time, but I think that the, the craft can sometimes be bound up in that. And um, third thing, I would, I would, you know, be be humble. Be, be humble about what you about you know. You know what's the the um, Alcoholics Anonymous prayer? You know, help me recognize the distance between. I, I think the equivalent of this would be the things the things that I know and believe in, and the things that um, that I that I recognize are still in debate and dispute. Whether it's you know on a topic such as abortion, where I would say that even even the most ideologically passionate uh, people on both sides of the debate probably in the, in the watches of the night would recognize that there are certain questions that they simply cannot answer. So, so be a good disseminator of the facts, uh, be a good listener and be humble, and support your local media. But that's really the most important. <laughs> <laughs> um, who else wants to add to that, Scott? I think it's, it's desirable to, to begin with your personal definition of what is civil discourse. Um, because without that North Star, um, we, we sort of say, well, if, it, if we disagree with it, then that's, that's toxic. How could they possibly <laughs> say that? And if it accords with our view, then you can't say it more loudly or too often. So I, I think that individually we have to say, what is our what is our expectation? When, when is the hair in the back of our neck going to stand up? And it may not be a societal determination. What about name calling? Hmm? Name calling. Name calling. I, I, I think that. Can we agree that that's not so? No, I, I think I, I, I have this view, and, and, and again, you can disagree with this uh, as, your, as your want. Thank you. You're, well, I knew you would. <laughs> but but I, I, I believe that our, our, our ethical compass, our sense of propriety, does not reside in our brain. That, that misleads us all the time. It resides in our viscera. It is that instinct, that sense in your gut. And when you hear something and your gut feels uncomfortable, you say, I wish they didn't say it, I wish they didn't say it using that, those words. I'm reasonably certain that you, I'm reasonably certain it violated my sense of, of propriety. Uh, as soon as I cycle it through my brain, I'll ask, does it accord with my view? <laughs> and if it did, then... then. But the, the, I think the other thing is empathy, and then I'll stop. I don't want to reach all for it. Um, you know, sympathy is, is generally, I feel bad for you. Empathy takes more energy. You get in their shoes, and, 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 and you see that. And might I give an example, and my wife will take issue with this example, as will some of you. But I, um, you, you know, the, where I come from, where, when your child goes to college, you put the college sticker on the back of your car, which, by the way, is illegal. You're not permitted to do that. I mean, if I was, the, but you do. And, and I, I began to think about, you know, I'm driving on Long Island Expressway in this a very nice car, and there's someone, because I'm a lawyer, and there's someone behind me who's driving a 10-year-old Ford, and he's thinking, well, that's a nice car, because he's behind me for an hour and a half on the Long Island Expressway. <laughs> and, but he's also confronting the stickers on my, my rear window, which might say, it does not in my case, but MIT, Harvard, um, and, and he's staring at that, and now it's not about that him, it's about the fact that his children, who he loves a lot, will be going to community college or no college at all. And he enters that Ford Focus, a Democrat or a centrist, and he comes out a Tea Party member. And I say to myself, and so I, I've, I've had this conversation, what, whatever one does, empathize, try to get into their shoes and see the world the way they do, and if you can express it and then apologize to them, or not seen it before, because apologies build remarkable virtues. I think that that can be effective. So, Lara, we were talking about three things that all of us in this room should do to um, encourage more civil discourse. 
Um, so I will talk a little bit about what I teach my students when we talk about mediation. And the first thing, um, so just to, to really build on what we've already heard about listening, is not to forget that another way to listen is to read. So sometimes you aren't in the room with people who disagree with you or you're not ready for the conversation, but you can certainly go and read things written by people who disagree with you. And that's another way of listening, to sort of understand where they're coming from. If you come at that with an, an open mind, and in some ways that gives you time to process. Um, another thing is to, uh, if we're talking about something deeply divisive like abortion or, or pretty much any other controversial topic, um, a sense of perspective by thinking about what the history of that debate is. In other words, it's not just sort of agreeing on facts, but being an informed participant in a discussion and kind of know, well, how long have we been arguing about this and why? And what is the history I like to make my students look up? Supreme Court cases. <laughs> like what, what is the history of, of what we're talking about to get us? It's another way of listening. But I think ultimately when it comes down to empathy, which is hugely important, one thing that we can often forget because we're sort of arguing often things that we really believe, and I agree it's kind of hard and not head often, is that the other person um, that we're engaging in civil discourse with uh, shares kind of three assumptions with us about themselves, and we don't want to forget that most of the people that we're engaging in discourse with, believe that they are intelligent, they believe that they're pretty good critical thinkers, and most importantly, they believe that they're moral people. And if you violate that sense that they have of themselves to sort of say, well, I think you're immoral, or I think you're dumb, or you know, you must have just fallen off the turnip truck, that shuts down everything. Right, that, I mean, that just creates defensiveness. So just keeping in mind right, that you may not agree that there are any of those things, but respecting that they have that belief about themselves goes a long way. We should all put that in our back pocket. Yeah. Um, Linda, this is from an audience member. I often feel like listening and empathizing to people with opposite opinions to mine means compromising my basic morals. I respect that others have different stories, but why should my bo most basic standards of human dignity be set aside? Well, civil discourse, again, doesn't mean that you're going to change your opinion or change your values or go over to the dark side. <laughs> It means that you're just willing to listen. I, th I think it's important to sort of approach the conversation, um, like have a mind like a willow tree, which is very flexible and will bend. And go into the conversation thinking that this might be a chance for me to learn something. Uh, when m my grandson Quinn was about four, we were having a conversation in the car. And he said, he calls me Lala. And he says, Lala, he says, I have so much knowledge in my brain and I don't even know what some of it is. <laughs> and I said to him, well, that's really cool. What is it? And he said, well, I can't tell you, he said, but I can tell you this. It's an art form. It's called the art of not knowing. <laughs> and I think that if we, enter a conversation with that art form in mind that we might learn something. It doesn't mean we will change what we think, but we might be able to look at something from another perspective, and we might deepen the relationship with that person and understand that individual better. And I think, I hope that answers the question. Absolutely. Lala. <laughs> um, this is another another question from the audience, Casey, and this is, I think, tailored for you. How do we maintain ground rules? Is it necessary to call out an incorrect fact when attempting to establish a dialogue? Yeah. Oh, I, I, absolutely, without a doubt. Um, 
I, I think that, yeah, the, the, the establishment of, of facts, of precedent, of history to an issue is absolutely important to have, um, to have a debate about it. Um, yeah. I, um, what if it then veers off into, you know, a debate about that particular fact and you're losing the forest for the trees? Um, I, I, I think you have to pick and choose what the facts are that really matter, but your conversation isn't going to go very far if, okay, for example, can I give you an example from today? Yes. Okay, I'll do try to do this very, very quickly. So this morning, um, somebody, uh, uh, there was a discussion of whether or not the comment, this once again, this was on Capital Confidential in the blog comments that I should just stay away from now that I've been promoted. I don't have to do this anymore, but you know, when I'm trying to help out, I will get in there and approve comments. And there was a discussion as to whether or not the American Communist Party had endorsed Hillary Clinton in 2016. And they hadn't, they had not, but a blog commenter was insisting that they had, and I said, the Communist Party did not endorse Hillary Clinton, and here's a link to um, the popular fact debunker site Snopes that demonstrated it. And I don't know if people like or dislike Snopes, I find it to be very, very dependable, because, primarily because it doesn't just state something, it offers backup for it. It offers copious links that you can go to from valid, trusted sources, you know, primary documents, that type of thing. And this person's response was, well, of course, Snopes, they're sponsored by Soros. You've, you must deal with this all the time. No. Sno Snopes is um, a tool of George Soros. And that, of course, led to a response from another commenter that said, this is actually just a popular right-wing meme that, uh, that Soros is behind Snopes, and it's not true. And to back it up, they offered uh, something from Snopes in which Snopes debunked this. And of course, this turned into this kind of cycle where it's like, oh, of course you're using Snopes to debunk, debunk an attack on Snopes. Give me a break. And my response was, well, if you read what Snopes wrote, which offers and includes links, what do you, what are you gain saying? What are you, what are you disputing here? And of course this person then or, uh, offered another link to uh, a press uh, release from the American Communist Party that was the party's answer to the question of why they supported Democrats. And this was the person who had initially said that the Communist Party had endorsed Hillary Clinton. And literally the first question was, why does the party sometimes support Democrats instead of your own candidates? And the answer was, the party will never endorse candidates who are not candidates from the American Communist Party. And this was the person who insisted at the outset of this conversation that the Soviet Party had, had endorsed Hillary Clinton. And I was like, we could be here all day. It's like the poodle. So, it's like it's the Churchill and the poodle. <laughs> yeah, and this happens a lot. And one of the things that you wanted to talk about, Laura, is the fact that we cannot have our own facts. And we do need to sort of mutually determine which sources we can depend upon for objectivity, although clearly that's not always going to be agreed to. Um, this is made more difficult by what you just illustrated, which is that study after study shows that um, people who uh, are most affiliated with a particular ideology, when confronted with facts that contradict their ideology, will double down on their ideology, right? In other words, facts aren't always persuasive. So while I do agree that it's difficult to have any kind of discourse without a shared set of facts, and, and this is something in my family that we go back and forth about, right? Like, Dad, that's just not true. Um, but at least he says, well, show me, show me different facts, right? And so if you can get to there, you get it somewhere, but um, it can be really difficult because psychologically, apparently, we're not built to be persuaded by logic. And as a teacher of rhetoric, this is really depressing. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, it looked like you had something to say. Nothing. Well, I, I don't think it's worthwhile, but I think 
I won't say it. <laughs> I got the, the, the treaty I can't avoid. Uh, the, I don't intend to sound provocative. Um, I really don't. But I'm not a fan of facts. Um, I mean, to me, life is like Wikipedia. Do you, do you use Wikipedia? And, and, and as people use it, they're, they're encouraged to correct the semicolon, the underlying fact the date was off by a year, and they're encouraged to do that. And, and so Wikipedia is a consensus uh, perspective on a historical event. It probably, in the aggregate, comes closer to, to what, what we, as, as an imperfect species, consider fact because we're all putting our own views together. No one has to write Republican or Democrat or anything. You just put it in, and then you end up with this consensus perspective, which is reliable. My, 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 I, I like when I hear the notion of the, the dependent clauses, conditional clauses. Um, I think, I believe, I understand. Something that reflects the human condition. I think, I believe, I understand. Um, I understand that the, the, you know, the, the, some of these assertions with respect to the Communist Party and the like are probably absolutely the closest to false that there could possibly be. Until in four years from now, we find an email that caused us to say, well, well maybe it wasn't. And so my view is. But that's. Well, I'm not to interrupt. But that's different. That's there's a different. There's a difference between nuance and the difference between something which is clearly factual and something which is fictional. It, 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 there may be, but 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 I think that <laughs> stating that something is in fact is incendiary. We saw what you did there. What? <laughs> Just saying that. <laughs> you, well, we saw what you did there. Oh. Yeah, but, but I do think it's incendiary. I think when you, you say to someone that you are in possession of unimpeachable, immutable information that will withstand the, the test of time, they will start with the premise that I wish you hadn't said that. <laughs> okay, what if you what if <laughs> start? Can't you, what, what is wrong with saying, to the best of my knowledge, this is? Well, right. Yeah, that's, but that, I think, is what we're talking about, to the best. I mean, this is sort of how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, but it will, first of all, I'm not, you know, I'm a journalist, you are a lawyer, and lawyers are, lawyers are advocates for a specific position in the, the battle that takes place in a courtroom, and I would argue that Attorneys on both sides of a courtroom battle have nothing in their quiver but, at bottom, facts, which they can choose to deploy in various arrangements, but it is facts that they are, that they are ultimately going to have to base their arguments on. Okay, this is my retort, and then I will turn it over to my colleagues here. But I, I, I'm irrepressible in this regard. Um, I, I think you are absolutely right. I think that's a fact, but it's a perception. I think that's absolutely right. But, but I, I do, I, I, I think that, that the, sometimes the optics of laws are a very small percentage of, of, of legal interactions that occur in the courtroom. The overwhelming majority occur outside the courtroom where I think, I believe, I perceive, why does your client say that? That, that sort of conditional exchange moves you toward really what I thought the heart of, of undermining toxicity is, which is consensus resolution. So in, yes, in that 7% that or 6% or whatever it is in the courtroom, I grant you, you're correct.